Good morning. Good morning. Okay, all right. Glad you all are here today, and uh, we're very appreciative for your attendance and your interest. Let me just remind you uh, very quickly before we get going that uh, this week and the next two Sundays are Friends and Family Day, so we ask you to park a little further out, and when services, uh, when we get ready for our services next, uh, since on these longer pews, if you'll scoot into the middle of the pew, instead of just anchoring the in there, as most guys do. Um, scoot in so our guests won't have to climb over top of you. Uh, so let's get started with a word of prayer and then we'll get into the class. Our Father in God, we're asking, Lord, that you'll do great things here and that uh, you'll be with us and be with the hundreds of invitations that have been extended over the last several weeks. Um, Lord, that we can be a light uh, to this community that we can help more people find their way to you and more people find their way to heaven. Uh, we're asking for your blessing on our class tonight, uh, today. Help us to uh, open our minds to see the wonderful things you have in store for us. Help us to remember that you're always looking for us, always wanting us, always desiring for us to come to you. Help us to recognize that and to try to do that to the best of our ability. We love you, Lord, and we thank you and ask you to do a mighty work here at Central in Jesus' name. And amen. Okay, yeah. Sandy Lathrop fell, broke her arm. That's Christine's daughter. Uh, okay, so let's begin uh, as I did last week. Uh, we're going to do some Bible flashcards, if you will, and... Uh, see what kind of knowledge we have here. So uh, what did we say last week was the reason that God wrote the Bible? What? I can barely hear a whisper, but to, to what? Reach out to man is the answer. Correct. Okay. Uh, all right. Number two. So which prophet was told to marry a woman of harlotry? Any other guesses besides Hosea? That's the correct answer. I just wondered if there was any other guesses. Okay. Hosea was told to marry a woman of harlotry. We don't know if that was a, a woman who was a prostitute or raised in a, a home of prostitution or what. The, we, we don't know the background of it all, but we do know that much. All right. How many books are in Psalms? Huh? Five. Five books are in Psalms. How many of you knew that? And we're just afraid to answer. Okay. Take your Bible and open to Psalm number 42. Or if you're going to cheat and use a digital device, you can do it there too. Psalm 42. Look what's right above Psalm 42. What do you see? Besides a title that maybe your Bible's put in there. What? Book 2. Okay, so Psalm 1 to 41 is book 1. Psalm 42 to 72 is book 2. 73 to 89 is book 3. 90 through 106 is book 4. And 107 to 150 is book 5. So yeah, just we're just giving you some information here. Some, if you're ever on Jeopardy, okay, Bible. Nobody, if you're on Jeopardy, nobody will choose the Bible section. I'm just telling you. If you ever watch, you'll be able to just rip through that whole line, okay, uh, on there. All right. So what church sent Paul out on a missionary journey? Uh, on the missionary journeys, I should say. What what was the church that did that? What? What? Jerusalem? No. Antioch. Which Antioch? Antioch of Pisidia or Antioch of Syria? Because they're both mentioned in the Bible. Syria was a good guess, and you're right. Okay, it was. Okay, it was a guess, but it was right. Syria? When you asked it like, you know, like that. Okay, number five on our questions today. Jacob and Esau were twins, right? 
Okay. You all awake yet? Okay. Jacob and Esau were twins, right? Okay, right. Okay. So what other twins are there in the Bible? Figure the saps might know this with a multiple of no? Okay. Grandchildren. Huh? No. Isaac and Rebecca, they married each other. That wouldn't be a good idea. Okay. Anybody? Zira and Perez, back in Genesis 38. Of course, everybody knows Gen- Zira and Perez, back in Genesis 38, verses 27 to 30. And there's a New Testament person as well who is a twin. Thomas, how would you know that? Didymus is an Aramaic word that means twin. Okay? Some traditions say that he had a twin sister. That would be doubting Thomas Okay, that we think of sometimes. All right, what is Tabitha best known for in the New Testament? What? Okay, being raised back to life, okay, and what, what also is she known for by the women? For her good deeds of sewing and bringing and doing garments. In fact, they bring them down. So it's a beautiful testimony to her. All right, uh, where was John when he received the revelation? The Isle of Patmos. It's just a little rocky crag out in the Aegean Sea. Um, number, uh, number eight. So what prophet, what prophet caused an axe head to float? Okay, we got two answers, Elijah and Elisha. So which is it? Just his name starts with Eli. Is that what you're going to say? Okay. It's Sha, Elisha, okay, in 2 Kings chapter 6. How many people were baptized after hearing the gospel preached the first time? About 3,000, it says, okay. And who was the king after King David in the United Kingdom? You guys got to answer up. What? I mean, I'm going to be 65 next week. My hearing is going, so um, who? Solomon. Okay, good, good. All right. Uh, okay, so if you got all 10 of those, you got 100. If you got less than six, you failed. Okay, so, <laughs> so all right. We're going to talk about the Gospel of Mark today. Uh, we noted last week that Matthew, uh, we started out with Matthew's Gospel. The week prior, we looked at the Old Testament and just kind of ran through God's one purpose. We said that God's ultimate one purpose in writing the Bible I suggested to you is to reach out to man. That is what God is trying to do. He's trying to reach out to man, whether it's through the Old Testament writings or the New Testament. We said the Gospel of Matthew was written primarily with what audience in mind? A Jewish audience in mind. And uh, we loaded a, a number of things as to point that out as to why that is the case. I want to suggest to you today that we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark, and Mark is reaching out to the Roman mind. He has a Roman audience in his, in his purview, in his mind, and who he is writing to. Now, he's going to write the same story, the story of salvation and how God has provided us a Savior in Jesus. He's going to write the same things, but he's going to do it through a different set of eyes, and he's going to do it with a different purpose in mind as to who he's trying to reach specifically doesn't mean if you're Jewish that you shouldn't read Roman, I mean you shouldn't read Mark, or if you're, or if you're Roman you shouldn't read Matthew, that's not what I'm suggesting. Uh, but I'm suggesting that that's who they had in mind, that was their target audience when they were writing their gospel account. So Matthew wrote with this Jewish mindset, Mark tells the same story from a different perspective for a different purpose. Mark's gospel was probably the first one written. So, being second in our New Testament does not denote chronology. It doesn't mean it was the second one that was written. It's probably the first one that was written. And I find that to be very heartening to me uh, because knowing the history of Mark, he had gone with Paul and Barnabas on a missionary journey, you may recall, and at some point he turned back and didn't go with them any further. We don't know the reasoning why. The Bible didn't tell us the reason why he stopped. But we do know that he stopped and he quit. He left them in the midst of this journey that they were on, going and preaching 
setting up and establishing churches in different communities as they would go from place to place. Yes, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, Paul says in the very last gospel, of the very last account of anything that he wrote, he calls for John Mark to come to him. And he says to Timothy, bring John Mark, bring Mark with you. And do you remember why he says that is? No, it, uh, what? He's very useful to me, he says. Okay. Uh, he, he said he is very useful to me in the ministry. So, so here is John Mark who had been with Paul before and quit for whatever reason. Uh, we don't know. He, he's not tagged as being a, a, a quitter and I'm not going to touch him any longer. I'm not going to do anything with him any longer. Obviously he gets his act together or whatever it is that has caused John Mark to stop. Um, and now late in Paul's life while languishing in a Roman prison he writes this letter and he says bring John Mark to me because he's very useful to me for ministry. That, that's heartening to me because I know I mess up and I blow it and, and it's nice for me to think that God doesn't just write me off and say okay well you're done uh, and I shouldn't treat others that way either. So he has this Roman audience in mind. Now we looked last week and we said Matthew in, in his opening, um, how does Matthew start his gospel account? With a genealogy, well Mark's going to start with a genealogy. What's the difference between Matthew's and Mark's? Matthew traces the genealogy through whom? What? Well actually he actually tra chases it or traces it through David and Abraham is specifically who he says, who are regaled as Jewish patriarchs. I mean, they are heroes of the Jewish faith. So if I'm a Roman, let's just say that, that I'm a Roman, and that genealogy starts out that way to me and says, okay, here is Jesus who is the son of Abraham, who is the son of David, so on and so forth. What, what's that going to do for me? Not a whole lot. In fact, it might even anger me a little bit, right? Might even get me a little bit upset because I'm thinking, look, here's this Jewish thing again, or whatever it might be running through my mind. And so uh, that's not how he starts out. Mark starts out, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, who? The Son of God. So Mark goes all the way back to God. Now, what do we know about the Roman people and their belief in God? They had a lot. They are polytheistic. Yeah, they have a lot of gods that they regale. Even emperors or Caesars are regaled as gods in their minds many times. Uh, so, so he's going to trace Jesus all the way back to God. Not, not back to Abraham, not back through David, which wouldn't mean as much to a Roman mind. Uh, but he's going to take his true heritage all the way back to God. So what impact would that have on a Roman, do you think? Okay, it's going to have a lot more. I mean, it might make him stop and think, huh, this is kind of a different, per <coughs> excuse, <coughs> a different perspective, a different idea, something unique. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> it also might hint at a monotheistic belief. I mean, it might just kind of lay the groundwork a little bit. It's not really stated very boldly and brash, this is the one and true and only living God. But he does say that Jesus comes all the way back to God. And so <clears throat> it's an interesting thing just to consider the beginning all the way back to the Son of God. So um, second thing I want you to look at, and, and this is probably the, mo the biggest hallmark as to identify why Mark is different than Matthew. Because of the explanation of Jewish terms and customs. Look with me, <clears throat> chapter 7, verses, three, uh, verses 1 to 4. The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered to him after they came from Jerusalem and saw that some of his disciples were eating bread with unholy hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all other Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thereby holding firmly to the tradition of the elders. And it goes on to talk about the washing of pots and vessels and so on and so forth as that passage goes on. So if you were a Jew, would you need to say this to me? I mean, if I'm, excuse me, if I'm a Jew, would you need to say this to me in, in telling me what was going on that day? No. I mean, there'll be no reason for it because he says they did it with unholy hands. If I'm a Jew, I know, boom, exactly what he means. 
That means, oh, they, they ate without washing their hands in the way that the Jews washed their hands. That they had a very, very unique special rules on how they were to do it uh, as far as how much water and how it was to be. And you always had to have your fingers pointing down. The water had to run off the fingers this way down from them into the basin or onto the ground, whatever, if you're going to wash your hands according to the Jewish custom. So to say that, to a Roman, they say, well, what do you mean unholy hands? I mean, that would be kind of their thought that Mark's going to explain. Oh, that means with that unwashed hands. And then he tells you, parenthetically, Pharisees and the Jews only do this if they very carefully wash their hands. See, now to Matthew's audience, Matthew doesn't do that. Matthew doesn't go through and explain Jewish customs to the people that he's writing to because they already know it, okay? Look at this Look at this next one <clears throat> in chapter 15, verse 42. When evening had already come, since it was preparation day, that could even be capitalized, that is, the day before the Sabbath. If you're a Jew, you know that, right? If you're Jewish, you know that the preparation day is the day before the Sabbath. That's been something you've known and prepared. Okay, tomorrow's Sabbath, we have to get ready for this and this and this and this. Have all things all set out, done and designed in this way and that way and so on. But there's also other terms. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. So he translates an Aramaic word for us. Aramaic is the language that Jesus and the first century Jews would have spoken. And so he uses the term, this Aramaic term, Boanerges. And then if you're a Roman, you may not be as familiar with Jewish language or with, excuse me, with Aramaic language that would have been used by the Jews. And so he explains, he translates it. That means sons of thunder. Oh, okay. Now as a Roman, I understand that a little bit more or a little bit better. Chapter 5, verse 41. And taking the child by the hand, he said unto her, Talitha kum, which translated means little girl arise. That's, that's a literal translation, little girl to rise. I say unto you, get up. That's how the New American uh, Standard translates that. So again, he's, he's translating an Aramaic term for his readers so that they can understand it and know what he's talking about. Now, um, I, I'll tell you, that for a long time, for many, many years, this was a mystery to me. Um, I, I had never heard, didn't think about, didn't know anything about the difference of the four Gospels in that sense. And so when somebody pointed this out to me, it was like, wow, revolutionary. And all of a sudden, I can see in Mark what he's doing that I didn't see in Matthew. And see, Matthew's placement, as we said, as being the first book of the New Testament, is kind of like just turning the page of Judaism from the Old Testament to the New. Now he's going to attract or talk to the Roman audience as the Bible's put together for us. So again, an Aramaic term. The next one, and they have brought him to the place of Golgotha, that is, or which is translated, place of a skull. So most of us are familiar with that because we've heard it so many times. We don't know if it was place of a skull because there were so many skulls there from doing crucifixions and, and deaths regularly. Or if you stand back and you look at this rocky place where they believe Golgotha to be, the place where he was crucified, it kind of looks like a skull because there's holes in the hill, in the mountain, uh, that cliff that looks like a skull in, in some senses. So, we don't know the reason for that, but it's interesting that Mark does this and Matthew doesn't do this. So, um, so you understand what I'm saying, what I'm trying to get across with this? Okay, is it clear to you? Um, so, why, why do this? Why, why is it, if, if, if the Roman audience is who he has in mind, so, so why is the reason? I mean, we've explained how he's, why he does it so they'd understand it, but what's his general, what's the main purpose? Yeah, so that they get it, not just that they understand, oh, that's the word, that word means this word. It wasn't just that, but so that they'd get it and say, okay, he's reaching out to me. I mean, God is reaching out to me as a Roman trying to give me the information that I need. Not everybody in first century Jerusalem or in first century Judea was Jewish. And so, I mean, he's going to reach out to these others as well. All right, uh, so a question or thought, anything that him has... Okay, and when you wake up in about another 10 minutes, then we'll uh, 
All right, so let me let's talk about this use of power and action. Um, the Romans of the first century would have made great 21st century Americans because they really highly esteemed power and they really highly esteemed busyness and activity. Um, so our culture today, we highly regard those who are in positions of power and those who are busy and active. In fact, if somebody says they're taking a sabbatical or, or today, I'm unplugging today and I'm just going to be, and what, what's normally the thought of somebody like that? Why are you wasting a day or an hour or whatever? You know, uh, there's time enough to rest and that's when you die, okay? And that's what I've heard people say. Uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'll sleep when, I, when they bury me. Uh, but this idea is, is not new to our culture. The Romans felt very much the same way. Activity, busy, 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 busy. All the time, all the time, all the time. So, look in chapter uh, 1 of the book of Mark. We're not going to read all of this this morning, but we will go on and read some a little bit later. But on one day, one day of Jesus' life, he cast out a demon out of a man in the synagogue on a Sabbath, which in and of itself was going to be revolutionary. Okay? Why would that be? It's on the Sabbath. And, and what should you do on the Sabbath? Nothing. Okay? Just rest. And so Jesus obviously, in their mind, performed a work did something he was not supposed to do. Do you think Jesus, let me, let me just ask you this, it doesn't tell us in the Bible, do you think Jesus ever did that intentionally on the Sabbath? Absolutely. I mean, he was doing this to get their attention and to give them a teaching moment. And so he performs this miracle on the Sabbath and people go, ah, oh, you can't do that. Okay, And this is in a synagogue of all places. I mean, you're in a church building is what they're thinking. You can't do that, but he does, and he validates himself and his reasoning and his authority and so on. He also then after that goes and cures Simon Peter's mother-in-law of a fever on the Sabbath, and as a result of the demon-possessed man and uh, all that had happened there at the Sabbath, what would you figure would happen in town? Huh? He's cured this man in the Sabbath. What's going to happen around town? Oh, they're going to talk about it. I mean, the word's going to get out. And, and not just that here's somebody troubling and causing a problem, but what? He's a miracle worker. I mean, this guy can do amazing things. So if we read the rest of the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, rest of chapter 1, the sick and the demon possessed in all of around Capernaum were brought to him for healing and casting out of demons on the same day. I mean, the word got out. Let's say you were sick. Let's say your mother was sick, your aunt was sick, and you heard this miracle worker had come to town and everybody's attesting to what he had done. What would you do? Yeah, I'm going to go down. I want to get cured if I can. I want this demon cast out or whatever the case is. And so this all happens on one day that Jesus does all of this. So uh, chapter 1 and a verse, uh, let me see, verse, oops, I'm not in the right book yet. Let me get there reading off my notes. Chapter 1, drop down to verse uh, 35. Somebody read that one for me while I'm trying to find it in my Bible. My, Mark's in the New Testament, right? Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, so after the first day of all that activity, people coming and com coming and coming and coming, getting all this, the very next morning, very early, while it is yet dark, Jesus does what? gets up, tries to go away to a solitary place to talk to God, to talk with his Father. You know what happens after that? Apostles come and say, hey, everybody's looking for you. <laughs> the news has been spread even more. And Jesus responds to them, <clears throat> excuse me, that he essentially is, I, I didn't come to be a miracle man. I didn't come to do a, a side show of some kind. We need to move on and we need to go to other places and preach. The message is what Jesus was about, not about just the healing or the casting out of demons. All of those things were done to validate who he was, that he had the authority of God to be able to speak the things that he was speaking. Miracles were not done just for the sake of a miracle. Oh, wow, look, he healed this person. 
but it was to make me think, oh, wow, he healed this person. He must have power from God. He must be a, a, one who's come from God. I need to listen to him. What is he saying to me? And, and do what he says in that regard. So, um, so what impact do you think that would have? If, if you're Jew, excuse me, you're Roman, and you really highly esteem this idea of busyness and activity, and this is, this is one day in Jesus' life, what does this do for you? Okay, he's a go-getter, and, and, and so if I'm Roman and I like go-getters, what do I want to do? I want to, follow, I want to listen to him, see what he has to say. Uh, I'm going to at least hang around a little while to see what he does. Maybe this is just one day. Okay, maybe it's just a flash in the pan. No, let me just see if I can't maybe learn and follow and see and hear what he has to say and what he has to do. So, Mark's most common word is immediately. It's found in chapter 1, verse 10, verse 12, 18, 20, 21, 28, 29, 42, and 43. Immediately, he did, the old version says straightway. Okay, the old King James. Straightway he did this, straightway he did that. Immediately, Jesus moved from here to here to here to here to here. One thing after the next thing after the next thing after the next thing. If I'm impressed by activity and busyness, I'm impressed with Jesus. See, how busy he is and how active. Matthew doesn't do this. Matthew doesn't use the word immediately over and over and over and over and over again to try to get us to see it. Okay, I'm sorry, it's not in verse, uh, let me look at my notes here. No, that's right, 10, 12, 18, 20, 21, 28, 29, 42, and 43. And so, Jesus is very busy. He's very active. He's going from place to place to place to place, person to person to person, or if I'm just stay, if he's just staying at a house, He's taken person after person after person after person coming to him. You remember the occasion recorded for us that Jesus was there in a house and he was teaching and there was such a crowd of people. The friends come and they bring the fella and they break up the roof and they let him down. I mean, people are coming. They know about Jesus. They've heard about Jesus and, and they want to be healed by Jesus if they can. But the Romans also really highly regarded power. Again, a very 21st century idea for us. Look in chapter 1. We're going to look at a few of these. Chapter 1, drop down to verse 40. And a man with leprosy came to Jesus, imploring him and kneeling down and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and said unto him, I am willing to be cleansed. Look in chapter 2. Verse 1, when Jesus came back to Capernaum a few days later, it was heard that he was at home and many were gathered together so there was no longer any space that one could be brought near the door. And he was speaking the word to them and people came bringing this man who was paralyzed, carrying him and they break up the roof and they lower him down in. So, so Jesus has power over leprosy, chapter 1. He has power over paralysis in chapter 2. Look in chapter 3, verse 1. He entered a synagogue again and a man there whose hand was withered and they were watching him closely to see if he would heal them what <gasps> on the sabbath so that they might accuse him see it's not that they were interested in his teaching they weren't interested in listening or watching or seeing but they just wanted to have an accusation a reason to try to get him jesus has the man come forward jesus even directly confronts the idea is it lawful to do good on the sabbath or to do harm to save life or to kill. And everybody began to say, well, you know, no, what does it say? They were silent. They wouldn't answer. They knew they were stuck. Okay. Jesus was coming to do something. So, so he says unto him, stretch out your hand. He did. And the man's hand was restored. And rather than applause and, and great, this is wonderful. Now it's, this man is worthy of dying. Okay. Because he did this. So he cures a withered hand and look in chapter 4, verses 35. On, the same, or on that day, excuse me, when evening came, he said unto them, let's go over to the other side. After dismissing the crowd, he took them with him in a boat, just as he was 
uh, was. The other boats were with him, and a fierce gale wind developed, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already filling with water. And yet Jesus himself was in the stern asleep on a cushion, and they woke him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He got up and he rebuked the wind and he said, hush, be still. And the wind died down and became perfectly calm. So Jesus can speak to a raging storm and make it calm. In chapter 5, verse 35 through 42, Jesus says to this girl, as I mentioned before, Talitha kum, that is little girl, arise, and this dead girl comes back to life. He has power over death itself. Chapter 6, verses 45 to 50, Jesus walks on water. Chapter 7, verses 32 to 35, here is somebody who is deaf and has an impediment of speech. Jesus cures that. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 9, Jesus multiplies food to feed a gigantic crowd of people. So, he has power, he has power, he has power over this, power over that. Pa- raging storm, Jesus can make it stop. Leprosy, he can cure it. Withered hand, blindness, death, whatever the case is, over and over and over again, he proves himself. Um, let's see, I had a note here. Um, okay, I don't see it there, so we'll get on a little bit. I th- think it is that he can, that Mark includes 19 miracles and only four parables, if I'm right on that number. Um, so he's trying to show Matthew's, there's much more parables. Do you know how many? Do you remember how many there was? No? Okay. I mean, he introduces in chapter 13 of Matthew and then begins to use parable after parable after parable to the Jews. Mark only uses four parables, but 19, as I recall, 19 miracles that he performs. So again, it's power that, that's emphasized. Then his use of preaching. <clears throat> Simon and his companions eagerly searched for him. And this is in chapter 1, back where we were talking before. And they found him and they said, everyone is looking for you. And he said unto them, let's go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that we may also preach there. For that's why I came. So his use of preaching. Mark records it for us. I'm not here to do a miracle show even though he records 19 miracles. Jesus said, no, this is not what it's all about. I have things to do, and the thing that I have to do mostly is to go and to preach, for this is the reason that I came, he said. This is the purpose in coming. Um, Someone once noted this, said the gospel of Mark begins with the preaching of John the Baptist. It continues with the preaching of Jesus and concludes with the preaching of his believers. You, you can preach that sometime, Jeff. Uh, so, but that's a great three-point lesson, really, just through the Gospel of Mark, that you have the introduction of John the Baptist, then you have Jesus, then you have believers going forth. So how did Jesus exemplify God's overall purpose in reaching out to man? Uh, that is, why was he here on earth? How does he show that in, Go- in Mark's Gospel account? Well, in his preaching, he preaches to masses, He heals masses, and he is commissioned to go to them. That's his purpose. And then once he's getting ready to leave, what does he do with the message? He hands it off to his apostles and says what? Now you go take this message out to all the world. Preach this message everywhere you go. And what's our responsibility? Our responsibility is to carry forth that same message as well. So let me look at this his final marching orders. He said unto them in chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. One who has believed and has been baptized will be saved, but the one who has not believed will be condemned. So God reaches out to man. What are the apostles supposed to do? They're supposed to reach out to man as well and take this message out. So why? Why is it so important that Jesus does it? I mean, what's so important about this message? Hey, okay, it's going to save them. Or if you want to look at the negative side of this, without it, what? Yeah, God's wrath. They're going to be lost. Now, 
you know, maybe one of the reasons, maybe one of the reasons we're not as evangelistic as we should be is because we really doubt or question whether people who are not Christians are really going to go to hell or not. And we really struggle with that in our culture and in our time today. Do, do, we, do we really believe that our neighbor, our friend, uh, family member, whoever it is, the person who's not a Christian, if they continue on this path and die in that condition, that they're going to hell? Yeah, I mean, a lot of us don't believe that. that or at least it doesn't seem we do. Because if we had this cure for somebody who's dying of whatever disease it is, more often than not, most of us would be much more apt to share it. I, I, I'm not trying to cast judgment on anybody in particular. I'm, I'm saying this on me, it's on everybody. That our belief in the reality of hell needs to be as real as our belief in the reality of heaven. That God says... If you do this, here's the passage again. If you believe and you're baptized, you'll be saved. But if you don't, you'll be condemned. That's harsh language. That's not acceptable language in our culture today. I mean, we don't want to think in those terms. We don't want to talk like that, don't want to think that way. But the utter loss or condemnation of a soul is the result of somebody turning their back on God of refusing to accept the gospel of Christ. Um, so how might these marching orders affect somebody who is a Roman? And you read these words. I mean, you've, you've read 16 chapters up to this point, if you got here, and you're a Roman, you've seen all that Jesus has done, you've heard all that Jesus has taught, at least in Mark's gospel, what would this do for you? Okay. Okay, exactly. And so, if, if again, if I really highly regard activity and busyness and working, this has given me marching orders as well. I mean, I've got something I can do. I can join into this. I can be a part of this. And so, Mark is reaching out to the Roman mind, trying to tell them, look at all of the blessings and benefits that come from following Jesus Christ. You can be saved you can have the forgiveness of your sins, you have all of this, and you have a task to do. You have something you can do. You can get involved in this. You can be working right along beside these others who go out and do this. So, so he is bold, he is authoritative, he is strong, he is powerful, he is forthright, he is forward th <coughs> thinking, and he has a battle plan in mind. Jesus didn't just come for a while, leave and say, okay, well, it's on you now. You remember what he says? I'm going to be leaving, but what's God going to do? It's in John's gospel account. What's he going to do for the apostles? I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And what's he going to do? He'll remind you of the things that Jesus said. He's going to bring those things back to mind and teach you all the things that I haven't taught you yet that you need to know. Why? So you can take that message out and you can reach out to people and you can help save their souls. That, that's, that's the whole purpose of it. So... Um, Look in chapter 16 now. We're looking at Mark 16. We'll close up with this in just a minute. Look in chapter 16. We have the resurrection. Jesus has been crucified. Verse 1, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. You remember when he was buried, he was very hurriedly buried before because of the approaching Sabbath. So now the Sabbath is over. They brought down all the spices to do this. And very early, the first day of the week, they came to the tomb where the, when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, who will move, who will roll the stone from the entrance of the tomb for us? And looking up, they noticed that the stone had been rolled away, for it was extremely large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. But he said unto them, Do not be amazed, for you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See, here's the place where they laid him. But go and tell the disciples and Peter, there's, that's a beautiful 
I think inclusion there. He is going ahead to you to Galilee, and there you will see him just as he told you. And as they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to one another for they were afraid. So Mary, that these women come down to the tomb, and they see an angelic being in the tomb, I am presuming, uh, and he's sitting there, and he says, in essence, what are you doing here? <laughs> he's, he's not here. And he gives them this commission to go out and to teach or to preach or to tell the news. So the very first evangelists in the, God, in, the, in the Bible are women. So don't ever feel like, and sometimes we think women can't be effective in God's ministry and in working. The very first ones were women. You go out and tell the disciples and Peter. Why, why, why might he say it like that? I mean, wasn't Peter one of the disciples? Yeah, so why say it like this? What? Yeah, I, so in, in the, remember, before this cock crows, you'll betray me three times, the Lord said, okay? Uh, in, in one night. Well, Peter could have been eaten up with sorrow to the extent that he does what Judas does and goes out and hangs himself. But go tell the disciples, and Peter, don't forget Peter, get him too. And tell them this. Now, look at verse 9. Now, after he had risen early on the first day of the week, he first appeared to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out the demons. And what does she do? Look at verse 10. What does she do? She went out and told everybody about this, okay? She told the people that she was able to. So, Mary Magdalene, when confronted with the resurrection of Jesus, she hurriedly tells other people. So, look at verses 12 and 13. Now, after that, he appeared in different form to two of them while they were walking along the way to the country. And they went away and reported to them who did not, be, uh, and they did not believe them either. So, so here, this message goes out to these two disciples, and they go spread the word further and further. And then what did the apostles do with the news? Verse 20. They went out and went everywhere, preaching the word of the Lord and confirming the word with signs. So this message is going to go out. He gave them marching orders. Take it out, take it out, take it out. Go spread the news. And that's what they do. All right, next week we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke. We have folks already in the foyer, guests and otherwise. So please act like you like him anyway. Okay. Put a smile on your face. Greet our guests. And uh, you may now pass it.